It's an honor to be here. I really appreciate you inviting me. I've been doing weather for 13 years, two and a half of those at CNN. But one thing I will never forget is the first tornado I ever covered. I was a few months into my career working in Beaumont, Texas, 21 years old, and I was pumped. I had seen the movie Twister. This was exciting stuff, right? So the storms start firing up around, I don't know, 6, 7 o'clock in the evening. I had just come off of a 10-hour shift, and I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't going to miss this for the world. So I stayed overnight. We learned in the wee hours of the morning, around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, that a town had been hit. And so I stayed there for the rest of the night. The next morning, my boss came in, and it was like one of those me-me type situations. I want to go to this town. I want to check this out. This, this was my first, right? So 9 o'clock in the morning, we grab a cup of coffee. We head about an hour north to this town, Jasper County, Texas. And when we rolled, we rolled in, the adrenaline's pumping. I'm super excited. We rolled up into the neighborhood, and everything about me completely changed. My whole mood changed. I saw two by fours, I saw piles of rubble, I saw shingles. The very first time I ever saw a pine needle stuck inside the trunk of a tree. That happens when the winds are so strong in a tornado, pine needles can stick inside of a tree like a tack. I saw that for the first time. And then I saw people's faces. They were dazed, they were confused, they were looking through the rubble trying to find anything that reminded them of a normal life, a picture, something from their home. At that moment, I realized that these are real people and what we do is very real. And from that moment, my opinion of what I did as a meteorologist completely changed. You're about to see a video of basically what I do on a day-to-day basis and it'll give you a better idea about what I just talked about. NOAA and NASA have now concluded that 2015 was the warmest year on record globally. one of its lowest minimums in decades. 2015 is set to be the warmest year on record. Sea level in South Florida has been rising at about eight millimeters a year. 15 of the last 16 years have been the warmest on record. Now, all of the images you just saw were from, believe it or not, the end of 2014 to the end of 2015, about a 12-month time span, and there are many, many more. 
Since I've been working at CNN, I do less of the day-to-day -day forecasting and I do more storytelling. I see images like these all of the time and we share stories to our viewers. How many were impacted? What does all of this mean and what caused it? More times than not, the question of climate change comes up. Records are breaking all over the world. Records for heat are breaking globally. Records for rainfall in the US and Africa. Droughts in California, California, India, and Asia. Tornadoes in the Southeast are gaining attention for their strength and speed. They've labeled this area Dixie Alley. It's a totally different area than Tornado Alley. Hurricanes are breaking records. Early in my career, I was always asked if I believe in climate change. Now I'm asked the question, was this tornado or this hurricane from climate change? Minds are shifting and people are concerned. No one can say that one particular flood in the US was from climate change or this specific tornado in Bangladesh was from climate change. But what we do know is that we can expect more events in general. We will have uh, more extremes. Cyclone numbers are going to continue to be high and strong. Heat waves will continue to worsen. In fact, snow events will also be more extreme. I cannot tell you how many times I'm traveling across the US buried in three feet of snow, covering a snowstorm, and someone will come up to me and laugh and say, really, you guys call this climate change? That, that is an extreme, and those are the weather extremes we're talking about. In fact, the climate change is happening we are warming, we know that, right? The fact is that we've heard a lot about the number two, two degrees Celsius. That's the number we're all trying to stay below. But when you look at it, it's very scary. These are the temperature anomalies from the last five years. And you can see 2010, 2014, 2015. We are about 0.8 degrees above normal. But look way up high at 2016, 1.2 degrees, in fact, we're higher than that. And in fact, the last 12 months, they have broken the record from that month from the previous year. So basically, January 2016 was the warmest January ever recorded. February was the warmest February ever recorded, and so on. We've done that for 12 consecutive months. And so we are going to get to that two degree number very, very soon, if not higher. If we hit that two degree number, that's when we will start to see massive animal extinctions, severe droughts, and ocean acidification to a level we've never seen before. And that's just the beginning. And you can see where most of the warming is occurring. Much of it is occurring near the poles. You see up there to the north. That's why we're losing so much sea ice, and that's where we're seeing so many of these extremes. In fact, the last 10 years, we've seen the top five deadliest heat waves Europe in 2003, last 13 years, 71,000 people died. Russia, 2010, 55,000 people. Europe again in 2006, you guys may remember that. And then India, 2015. I lived in Miami for four years before moving to Atlanta to work for CNN. I have a friend, George, there. He lives on Fort Lauderdale Beach, beautiful stretch of beach in South Florida. Every time the tide comes in, he is trapped inside of his home because the water comes above A1A and into the parking lot of his building. He actually has to wait until the tide falls before he can leave. This didn't happen when he first moved in, but it's happening now. In fact, he took this time lapse one time when the tide was coming in during a full moon. I forgot to mention it happens during the full moon and the king tide specifically when uh, this happens. But it's unbelievable. The water comes up so high, so he has to plan his day around when the tide rises and falls. He's a fisherman, so he can appreciate that, but not to leave your house to go to the grocery store. Miami Beach has spent millions of dollars installing these pumping stations because every time there's a full moon, same thing happens down there. The water comes up over the roads, and people can't get around. So now they're pumping water out of South Beach and putting it back in the bay because the water is so high. Something that once seemed like a doomsday scenario is now playing out right before our eyes. I think it's great that the political leaders have finally started to see the truth and begin working on a plan. Honestly, I think they're a little late to the table, but at this point, it's something. I think two things need to happen. Yes, we need to search for ways to reverse climate change, of course, and cool the planet. But I think the more immediate 
scenario is to find ways to live with it. Mitigation will be the most urgent need over the next couple of decades. How do we keep entire villages that live on those vulnerable coastlines from having to relocate? How do we protect the millions of people living along the coastline uh, that live within feet of the water? How do you protect people in the lines of powerful hurricanes and monster floods? While we are finding ways to cool our planet, who is going to take care of the vulnerable people already living with it every single day? South Florida has suffered from several extremely hot years, just like many cities across the planet, and the coral is bleaching to a rate they've never seen before. So I have a friend, Ken Nettemeyer, in the Florida Keys. He's come up with a way to grow coral. In fact, he grows them underwater in these coral nurseries. He grows staghorn coral. He has taken the coral, the strongest corals that have survived the ocean acidification and the ocean bleaching, and those are the corals he's growing. And then he takes them and he plants them on the reef. I went down and visited with him and visited his coral reef. That's Ken and myself right there. And that's some staghorn coral in the foreground of the picture that he planted about two years ago. This is working. That's where I turn to you. I tell stories, and you guys in this room have the brain to make a difference. I want to tell stories about you and the difference you make. I know there will always be people like I saw in that small town in Texas, but I hope one day there will be fewer of them, fewer people who have to look devastation head on because you have come up with a way to protect them. All it's going to take is one of you with one great idea in this one world to make a difference.